Today we're going to be talking about accounting for share capital transactions. When accounting for par value shares, we can either use the journal entry method or the memo entry method. In this video, however, we will only focus on the memo entry method which is more commonly used. So the main difference between the two methods would be the accounts use. The four most basic transactions involving par value shares are authorization, subscription, collection, and the issuance of stock certificates. So shares may be issued at par or below par. For authorization under the memo entry method, we simply make a T account and then label it according to the type of stock. So here we have ordinary share capital and then we put a memo here authorized to issue how many shares and the par value. And then we have subscription. Shares are subscribed when investors have contracted to acquire them but are still to be paid on a future date or on an installment basis. To record subscriptions, we simply debit subscriptions receivable dash ordinary since we need to specify the type of stock and then we credit subscribed ordinary share capital. If the share is issued above par, we need to credit share premium for the amount in excess of the par value. Again, you also have to indicate whether it's ordinary or preference. So here it's ordinary, and then we move on to collection. So when payment is collected, we simply debit cash and then credit subscriptions receivable for the same amount. Again, don't forget to indicate whether it's ordinary or preference. The last would be the issuance of stock certificates. So remember that stock certificates can only be issued upon full payment for the subscribed shares. So to record this transaction, you must debit subscribed ordinary share capital. So it's as if you're closing this account here and then credit ordinary share capital. So some investors may be able to pay for the full amount immediately so you would not have to go through subscription and collection anymore. So the entry for this would simply be to debit cash and credit ordinary share capital. So you just have to replace this debit here with cash and that is your entry. So for preference shares we have the same um, same entries. The difference would only be with regards to the label. So instead of ordinary, we have preference. So you just need to replace the word ordinary with preference. So here, 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 and here. When accounting for no par value shares, you need to first remember that there are two types of no par value shares. So it can either be no par, no stated, or no par with stated value. Now we move on to accounting for no par value shares. So as the name suggests, no par value shares are those that do not have a par value. So there are two types of no par value shares, namely no par no stated value or no par with stated value. So no par no stated value are sh those with no nominal value on the face of the stock certificates and no stated value in the Articles of Incorporation. No par with stated value shares are those that have no nominal value on the face of the stock certificate but have a stated value fixed by the Articles of Incorporation, the Board of Directors, or by holders of a majority of the shares entitled to vote. Remember that no par shares are deemed fully paid and its value cannot be reassessed. No par shares cannot be issued below 5 pesos and only the memo entry method is used when accounting for these. Note that insurance companies, loan companies, and public utilities companies as well as banks cannot issue no par value shares. Entries for no par shares are actually very easy. For those with stated value, two scenarios may arise. So first is when it is issued at the stated value or second when above stated value. 
When no par value shares are issued at stated value, you simply need to debit cash and credit share capital dash no par. This is important because you need to distinguish no par shares with those that have a par value. Next would be when no par value shares are issued above stated value. So here you debit cash and credit share capital no par value shares at stated value and then credit share premium dash stated value for the amount in excess of the stated value. When issuing no par value shares without stated value, you simply need to debit cash and credit share capital dash no par for the whole amount or consideration received. So here is a sample statement of shareholders' equity just to show you how contributed capital is presented. So you can see here that you first start with the um, beginning balances and then you follow with the ordinary shares. So for preference shares, we have the issued shares, the subscribed shares, and then the subscriptions receivable. And for ordinary shares, we also have the issuance, subscription, and subscriptions receivable. You can see that there are different columns for the various accounts. So first is the preference share capital, second would be the ordinary share capital, and then the share premium, then retained earnings, free and appropriated, and then treasury shares. We will be discussing more about the statement of changes in shareholders' equity in the later videos. There may be instances when a subscriber cannot pay in full the amount he subscribed to. The payment of the balance on subscription may either be specified in the contract of subscription or in lieu thereof may be subject to call by the board of directors. According to the Corporation Code of the Philippines, um, if within 30 days from the said date no payment is made, all stocks covered by the subscription shall thereupon become delinquent and shall be subject to sale. When a subscriber fails to pay his subscription on the call date, the corporation sends several notices to remind him of his obligation. If no payment is still made, his subscription is declared as delinquent subscriptions and the subscriber is now referred to as a defaulting subscriber. These delinquent stocks are then offered for sale in a public auction. In order to have possible buyers or bidders, the company would then advertise these stocks. All expenses incurred relating to the sale of the delinquent shares shall be charged or debited to the receivable from highest bidder account and this amount will eventually be collected from the highest bidder together with the unpaid balance of the subscription. The highest bidder is the person willing to pay the unpaid balance of the subscription plus any accrued interest and all expenses related to the sale and is willing to receive the least or smallest number of shares. The sale of the delinquent subscription would then be issued to him. However, the highest bidder shall only receive the number of shares he bids for. The excess shares are given to the defaulting subscriber. If there is no bidder, all of the delinquent shares will be issued in the name of the corporation. So such shares shall then be considered as treasury shares. The defaulting subscriber no longer gets any share of the stock. So here are the entries necessary when accounting for delinquent subscription using the short method. So first is, of course, you need to record any subscription for the shares of stocks. So that would require a debit to subscription receivable and a credit to subscribe share capital. And then, of course, there can be a partial collection. So that's debit cash and credit subscription receivable. And then a corporation may now send a notice to the subscriber and still no payment is to be made. So this is just an event and no entry is necessary to record this. So by this time, since no payment was made, um, the shares are now considered delinquent and the corporation can now advertise to sell the stocks. So here the corporation incurs costs related to the selling of delinquent shares. So 
that's debit receivable from highest bidder and credit cash. And then the highest bidder may now be chosen and he pays for the expenses incurred relating to the sale of delinquent stocks as well as the unpaid subscription. And then stock certificates are then issued. So you debit cash for the amount paid, which is equal to the receivable from the highest bidder and the subscription's receivable balance. And then you also have a debit to subscribe share capital to close this account and then credit share capital. So these two would pertain to the issuance of stocks while the three here would pertain to the payment of the stocks and unpaid balances. So that is if in case there is a highest bidder. So if there is no bidder, the corporation would buy the stock. So the entry for it would be to debit treasury stock, debit subscribe share capital, credit receivable from highest bidder, credit subscriptions receivable, and credit share capital. So you'd see that even though there is no bidder, there would still be an issuance of the stock. And now we move on to treasury shares. As it was previously discussed, treasury shares are those which have been issued and fully paid for, but subsequently reacquired by the issuing corporation by purchase or by donation. So there are three requisites for a treasury stock, which are, first, it must be the entity's own stock, second, it should have been issued originally before, and third, it must be reacquired but not yet cancelled. So treasury shares are presented as a decrease in the shareholder's equity and not as an asset. Another important thing to remember is that treasury shares no longer have the same rights of ordinary shareholders. Therefore, they are no longer entitled to receive dividends. A portion of retained earnings equal to the cost of treasury shares must also be restricted to protect creditors. Treasury stocks may be accounted for using the cost method or par value method. However, we would only be focusing on the cost method since this is the method allowed under local laws. So again, treasury shares can be acquired either through purchase or donation. So when we acquire through purchase, we simply record this by debiting treasury stock and crediting cash at the cost of reacquisition. It's as simple as that. And now we also have those that are acquired through donation. These are now referred to as donated stocks. So these stocks are still treasury stocks and may therefore be reissued at any price without any discount liability. Since donated stocks are secured without any costs, it does not affect the entity's assets, liabilities, and stockholders' equity, although it reduces outstanding shares. However, the reissue or resale of donated stock increases assets and additional paid-in capital or share premium. Take note that contributions including stock of the corporation received from shareholders shall be recorded at the fair value of the items received with the credit going to share premium donated stocks account. No journal entry is necessary to record the receipt of donated shares. Rather, we simply make a memo entry like this one. So, received how many shares from A as donation. To record the subsequent sale of donated shares, we simply debit cash for the amount received and credit share premium donated shares for the same amount. Treasury shares acquired through purchase can also be resold. So three scenarios may arise when it comes to the resale of such. So first is when it is resold at cost, second is above cost, and third is below cost. So when resold at cost, we simply debit cash and credit treasury stock for the amount received. 
When it is sold at above cost, we debit cash for the amount received, credit treasury stock at cost, and then credit share premium for the amount in excess of the cost. When sold below cost, the loss incurred must be debited to share premium treasury shares if there is an existing balance for this account until all the amount has been exhausted and retained earnings if the entire amount in the share premium treasury shares account has been fully exhausted. So first is when there is a share premium treasury shares account and it is sufficient to cover for the loss. So you just debit cash for the amount received debit share premium treasury shares for the loss and credit treasury shares at cost. Second is when you have a share premium treasury share account but the balance is not sufficient to cover for the loss. So you debit cash, debit share premium treasury shares and debit retained earnings for the remaining balance. And then you credit treasury shares at cost. The last scenario would be when you have no existing share premium treasury share balance. So you debit cash and debit directly to retain the earnings for the loss and credit treasury shares. So that's all for today and I hope you learned a lot.